welcome back to the podcast. I'm Anna Shaw. And I'm Kate Wilson. This week, I spoke with Sarah Altawadri, the Group Head of Marketing and Corporate Comms uh, at BSF in Saudi Arabia, which is our very first uh, guest from this region. So one that I was quite excited about. And um, Sarah just had some really interesting viewpoints. Uh, She's a marketer with a lot of experience and has come into the banking industry relatively recently. So has a lot of experience and a lot of views to share around um, the differences in banking and and how you you market within the banking industry and how that compares to other industries. Um, And just, I know we say this every time, but um, yeah, a really great episode, a really great conversation. I really enjoyed this one. Um, a couple of key points that that Sarah raised, which um, I think could relate a lot back to what we see in our research as well, and, and a couple of key points that I really agreed with. Um, she spoke a lot about the customer decision making and, and how, as a marketer, uh, it's really important to understand why a customer makes that decision, how they come to that decision. Um, and I think just the, the idea that it's not as simple as perhaps we sometimes make it out to be. So it's not as simple as this bank has the best price or this bank is, is the one I've been using for the longest. There's a lot of emotion that goes into these decisions. And it's really important that we really understand the customer's needs, their history, their background, what's important to them um, and, and how that plays into where they end up and what products they, they utilise The other point I thought was a a really important one, and and I know one that we talk about a fair bit as well, is just the competition that exists in banking. Um, The fact that it is a highly competitive market and and for customers, perhaps uh, something that they they see has been quite similar. So maybe thinking that all banks are the same or that all banking products are the same. Um, But Sarah did mention having worked in other industries, just how highly competitive the banking industry is, which I think is a a key point for for all of us to be thinking about when we're um, approaching um, our our roles in, in this industry, the fact that it is highly competitive, that um, all of the competition does drive us to create better products, better outcomes for customers, um, constantly evolving. And definitely one of the things that I like most about working in this industry as well. I think it's an interesting comment as well about coming from different industries, because I think we see some banking executives, you know, they've come from a bank, they move from bank to bank, and then you have other people who've come from completely different industries. And I think that diversity in perspective and experience can be really valuable in building banks or in representing banks or being part of the decision-making process. And I think that sometimes you can get some really interesting or different propositions or ideas coming from that different background. Um, So I think that's going to be particularly interesting, especially given, you know, it is a market we're not as familiar with. We're often talking about um, Australia or New Zealand or the UK, uh, but I think this is going to be a really, really different topic um, and I'm looking forward to to learning a little bit more about this as well. That diversity of opinion I think is another key theme that keeps coming up on these interviews for us as well the idea of having uh, people who come from different backgrounds um, the the idea that your experience and the different experience really does help to make sure that you're providing the best possible service and best possible products for your customers um, so uh, a theme I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to in future episodes as well. Uh, I also thought I'd just share some of our RFI group data from um, from KSA. So as you said, Anna, I think it's, it's a market that, that you and I have a little bit less experience with, but I know um, a lot of our colleagues do a lot of work out there. And um, I had a look at some of um, the, the research that we've been providing uh, to our clients in the region. Um, so a couple of key stats and, and ones that I found particularly interesting, um, the consumers in Saudi Arabia have very high rates of digital adoption. So we actually see over 90% of all adult bank consumers in, um, in KSA using digital banking channels at least monthly. And that is slightly higher actually than what we see in a market like Australia or the UK or even the US. So quite high rates of digital adoption. Sarah did talk a fair bit as well about the fact that we're starting to see fintech come into the market, um, mobile payments coming into the market. So really starting to change that dynamic. And when you do have, I think what we've seen in previous research, when you do have a quite highly digitally engaged customer base, those new fintech or those new digital products and services really do um, resonate with customers. They really do want to use them and it can really drive not just a shift in terms of the banking landscape, but it can also drive um, changes from from traditional providers and and really force them to to change their offering to to meet that demand to compete with these newer providers. So um, uh, sort of watch and see for me uh, in terms of that one. Um, and then the other one I thought was was important and, and interesting given the, the high rate of digital adoption is that digital is actually not really a key driver of choice in the region at the moment or in the market at the moment. Um, 
I suspect that will change if we're, if we're seeing customers using digital to a greater extent. If we're seeing more fintech in there, you would expect that digital starts to become more important to customers and, and more than just hygiene, more of a differentiator. Um, but at the moment, what's really key in, um, in Saudi Arabia in terms of driving choice is service and is brand. So again, key points that Sarah mentioned, um, the importance of of sort of differentiating on brand and making sure that you're marketing and, and talking to customers and making sure that they really understand um, the brand and, and, and what the, the bank is doing for them. So um, a couple of data points there and um, obviously a lot more that we do in, um, in terms of the research in that market, but they were a couple that stood out to me as being interesting. I think the thing that I like about the, you know, comparing our data across regions is that these drivers of choice, it's not just a one size fits all. It's not one data point for every single market, you know, for some, Digital is really important for others. It's really customer service. Um, in Australia, we're often talking about, you know, how critical is brand and reputation, particularly when you have things like the Royal Commission where reputation and brand and brand legacy really came into play. And then there's also, you know, to what extent if, if this many consumers are using digital, do they just expect it? Is it not a, a driver of choice? Because if, if digital is not an option, then it's not even in their consideration set. And I think how customers engage with their banking leads to different expectations. And as you mentioned, with different providers in the market, those expectations, expectations can shift and you can then have more and more competitors. You can have uh, different opportunities for customers to try different banks as well, or even the bar keeps getting higher and higher as the the standard gets raised and digital becomes better, more streamlined, easier to use. And I think, I think there's a lot we can learn from other markets as well in terms of why customers are choosing their bank and why, like, why is that different? You know, is it, are they having better experiences? Is there limitations with the technology? Are they leading? Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit more about that. The digital one's a, an interesting one, right? Because we we often look at digital as being not a key driver of choice. And sometimes that's because um, digital is not big in that market or it's not important to customers. And other times it's it's so important to customers that they have really high expectations and it actually doesn't dictate their choice because they're just expecting to have a really good digital service. Um, so, yeah, it, it's sometimes a bit hard to unpick if digital being a key driver of choice is uh, always not a key driver of choice because it's important or because it's just hygiene. Um, so yeah, an, an interesting one. I think one that we've done a, a lot of work on in the past as well. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking forward to this episode. So let's have a listen. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Really happy to have you. Why don't we start off with talking a little bit about yourself and your background. So introduce yourself to our listeners and, and tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you do at, um, at BSF. Sure. So Sarah Tuedji, I'm uh, a mother of a beautiful boy called Abdullah. And um, I joined BSF in 2019 uh, as the head of group marketing and, uh, and corporate comms. Um, prior to that, I, I'm just going to go a bit further down the line. <laughs> I started off with a, a finance degree from King Saud University, um, one of the main universities in Saudi, um, and then uh, started off with, um, with some work here and there in the finance sector. I didn't find myself at all, so made the shift, uh, did my MBA, and then started working in multiple international agencies in Dubai, where I moved. And then uh, uh, taught at the university, King's Road, same, loyalist, and um, started off with finance and then moved to, to marketing, uh, taught marketing for some time, and then left, left the university uh, and started my corporate uh, career. Uh, I was with um, Atayar Group, uh, which, is, which is renamed to Sira uh, for two years in the, in the uh, tourism sector. This was an amazing experience, learned a lot, and then joined uh, BSF in 2019 uh, as uh, the marketing lead. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically where I am today. In, in terms of interests, uh, neuromarketing has the highest interest to me. Uh, it includes the science of neuro neurology and, um, and marketing together. Uh, where you understand uh, human behavior uh, and the decision-making process and the interests and in, in how people actually uh, think and lead into certain uh, brands and, uh, and products. Um, this is where probably the interest, the interest of research 
uh, came into, into play and how I knew you guys. I was just going to say, as a, as a researcher myself, that is uh, an area of interest for me as well. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that area, actually, and, and maybe how it pertains to your current role? Yes, of course. Now, banking is a, is a very big industry, and it relies heavily uh, on, on service and relies heavily on understanding uh, customers' needs and um, willingness, willingness to take uh, certain products versus others. Uh, the the pricing, sch pricing scheme is, is massive because it's a main player of somebody getting trying to, getting into the, the, the whole realm of a banking uh, product is not easy. It's a big decision. It has a long lead time. And if we don't understand what gets, what are the parameters that play into this decision process, um, we usually lose, uh, lose that person. Um, and those banks or those entities that try to understand that process uh, find themselves at a, ahead of the game. It does have a lot of um, uh, input into understanding behavior, decision making, what um, what are the points that make a difference within this process? Uh, how do people really view uh, financial decisions? Money is a, is a very personal uh, topic and um, it is a determinant of a lot of things in people's lives. So if we don't understand how this, this, um, this player gets into the, the game itself and the inclusion of the equation that everybody is, is trying really hard to to, to have ends meet, to find ways to become better. Um, it would be very difficult uh, to sell somebody uh, any product if we don't understand the decision-making process. It's such a great point. I think in banking, there's often uh, what we do a, a lot of is, is trying to understand customers' decision-making process. And I think sometimes there's a bit of an assumption that price is the most important oh. thing to a customer. Um, but a lot of the time, price might factor in and a customer might say, yes, price is important. But I think there's a lot of other factors that really are more important when a customer is making a decision about where they bank and, and what products they hold as well. Especially this... Um in this era, uh, people are more, way more knowledgeable because um, information is democratized. A lot of people have access to different sources of information, different um, uh, people who would give advice. Um, they follow a lot, a lot of uh, influencers and uh, some thought leaders into the industry. And they, we find that our audiences are where, a lot more aware than we've assumed initially. So price is a good determinant at the end of the day. It might be the, the one factor that leans between the top two uh, in their research, but initially uh, becoming one of the top two in their consideration is where the real play comes in. Completely agree. We, um, I think that point about just customers becoming more knowledgeable is a good one as well. We found in our research the other day that customers are now using TikTok to learn about their finances, which Absolutely. <laughs> potentially <laughs> TikTok are doing a great job opening such a such a platform and allowing people to to talk and um, not talk basically express because it's more of an expression than uh, than just talking. Yeah. Um, the category finance and uh, and banking and anything that has to do with money is becoming very valid and important to all platforms and mediums so interesting. The you've obviously had a, a very varied background and, and lots of experience doing some some different sure. things. What I'd be quite keen to understand is um, coming into to banking and working for BSF. What are the things that you found most interesting and perhaps most surprising about the the banking and financial services industry? The, the most the most important to me uh, not important the most surprising uh, would be that uh, banking in general is, uh, is is not a binary uh, industry. It's not a black or white. Uh, there are many elements that get into the process um, that, that's quite funny. So you cannot really put things in, in one perspective and say, if I hit all of these, I will get a higher target market uh, share or um, I will gain more customers. It is, sometimes it has a lot of emotions and psychology that allow people to move from one place to the other, um, especially these days. Um, it is easy to easier, not easy, easier to switch from one bank to the other. Um, you find that banks and, and uh, the regulator are making um, kind of like information hubs 
that you can move around as a, as a customer from one bank to the other, but we're not in the realm of open banking yet. Um, I think one of the deterrents would be that um, the whole idea of information. So if a person knows somebody has a very low salary, but know the branch manager, he becomes a king, <laughs> that type of thing. Uh, you see a lot of, a lot of areas where uh, it's important to understand the elements more so than thinking that if I hit this list, I would, I would make it happen. That's not true. Um, there's, there's a lot of in-betweens. There's a lot of gray areas in the banking sector that you would um, have to consider in your communication and your business considerations altogether. Um, another thing that, that got me into um, the banking sector or surprised me is that I have never seen such fierce competition, ever. Not in FMCGs, not in, in, uh, uh, in the creative world. Banking is extremely competitive because it has layers of competition. It, it is not only about competing with uh, banks that are valuated the same uh, or have the same equity. It's not that. It is, there's a whole world around brand. There's a whole world around services. There's a whole world around reputation. Um, and they're, they're quite fierce uh, in the competition. So although it's very difficult for a, mar for a marketer, but at the same time, it's extremely exciting uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So competition is extremely high. From a corporate perspective, um, I've learned that there is a corporate intelligence and there is another realm called emotional intelligence. <laughs> and this is where women probably would do better it's, it's uh, the managing or understanding the between the lines and the EQ uh, more so than the corporate intelligence that um, men do really well in. Mm. Yeah, that diversity of, of opinion and diversity of experience and skill set, I think, is really important. The, um, the competition piece is, is interesting as well. I think there's often this perception from people who work outside of banking that, you know, there's just a few big players in each market and they win market share and, and banks are making all of this profit but yeah I completely agree my experience of working in banking has been exactly the same that there is fierce competition it is very hard to distinguish two banks from each other or two different products from each other um, I imagine it's very difficult to do as a marketer to make sure that your brand stands out compared to what to a customer looks like a very similar bank who's, who's just around the corner especially with the entrance of fintechs um, and uh, the, having this entire industry looking at the niche um, of, of products and services, be it on, on a financing basis uh, and lending or moving into lifestyle. So the, we're, we're going to witness an era of complete differentiation uh, in the banking sector. And uh, for a brand to stand out, uh, it would look at customer experiences and journeys um, and shifting the narrative from just a product that is related to money, but uh, into expanding the, the life cycle and moving into ambition and dreams and all of that. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing um, in Saudi Arabia at the moment, in particular around that fintech piece, the competition, some of those key trends that, uh, that are starting to appear in the market? It's, um, it's a big change uh, that we're witnessing in the industry. Uh, one of the main is, is um, uh, the entrance of STC uh, as a bank. Uh, STC is our Saudi telecom company. It's the biggest telecom company we have in Saudi, and the oldest, probably the first. And from there, um, they've managed somehow that uh, they got into um, uh, STC Pay. STC Pay is a wallet where you can manage your finances and um, transfer internationally and all of that. So today, SCC Pay, almost more than a year down the line, um, have gained a lot of momentum and a lot of people, including myself, uh, use SCC Pay on a day-to-day -day basis because they have really fun stuff. For example, during our holidays or our Eid holidays, um, they did uh, idea where I would put a group of people, my family, for example, and, and they would choose a number and they would get some kind of a gift, a financial gift from me. Um, and th these behaviors, these lifestyles, they're simple. They're very simple and easy to do. But they had the upper hand into uh, penetrating the, that type of lifestyle because of the ease of transactions. 
with a phone number. I don't have to put um, IBAN. I don't have to put any kind of information, just transfer money using phone number. Um, and, and they are the like first comers when it comes to that. And now they got a banking license. So just imagine what they can do uh, in a very short period of time with such an engine. Um, at the same time, uh, fintechs in general are becoming quite um, active. Uh, what fintechs in Saudi is just, it's not just about the technology itself. It's about um, the, the level of penetration that they can uh, get into. Um, so we're talking about banks, we're talking about wallets, we're talking about uh, making lifestyles easier, uh, making um, payments easier, making getting out, uh, traveling, uh, shopping, everyday lifestyles uh, easier and uh, more, more governed into your control. Uh, so th this is something that uh, is, is going to put a lot of players um, at the edge of their seats, let's say. Uh, we're quite prepared from a BSF perspective. Um, we're quite advanced into that from, from even starting off from a thought leadership second uh, by the products and services that we'll be introducing soon to the market. So um, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, we opened that door early on. I'm glad we understand the elements and the, uh, uh, and the, the building blocks of this industry. Um, we might be taking a bit of time or, or something like that, but it's not something that we're completely oblivious about. It's a lot of the, the daily conversations that we have and the daily work and decisions that we take. Um, BSF as a bank has been quite active in, in, uh, in a lot of this, of, of this industry and this era uh, in, in technology and in digitization um, and a lot of the processes in as, are quite digitalized um, and we will we're looking at a few years down the line where we would have the sleep of uh, this entire leap of where we where the the traditional banking is and where the future of banking would be uh, so I find myself with um, having daily conversations where I feel like oh my god that's I'm, I'm in the presence of brilliance here um, and it it makes it quite exciting day by day to know more, to search more, to um, uh, read more articles about uh, fintechs, open banking. Um, and because I'm in the industry, I know a lot about it. Otherwise, I don't think I would ever be interested on my own. <laughs> Yeah, one of the constant things that that I have, um, I, I mean, all of what you're talking about is so fascinating to me. And I love talking about these types of topics that obviously my friends and family don't quite feel the same. So having conversations about open banking and fintech, yeah. you, you often get a blank look. Yeah, I, I always I always find myself like that. So I'm happy we have uh, a lot of the young generation in the family who are quite interested. They are all interested. You wouldn't find a person who's not. Um, and I think it's the technology aspect. It's something that they, they feel close to and whatever relates to it uh, makes more sense, uh, especially in the realm of gamification. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by how tech savvy the new generation is. Very interesting. And there's such a, a, a speed of change um, in digitization as well. I mean, already sort of seeing the world move that way already. And you, you mentioned um, digital wallets that we're starting to see popping up everywhere at the moment. Um, I'm imagining that the pandemic and, and 2020 has probably helped to speed up some of that digitization. Um, have you seen a, a significant change in consumer behavior or in terms of what consumers really want from, uh, from their banks? I think that the pandemic didn't help, it mandated. Uh, we fun suddenly found ourselves not able to, to do our daily errands um, as we're used to. Uh, we had to get groceries online. We had to get medicine online. We had to get a lot of things online. And those companies that uh, had that direction ahead of time really won. Um, and those who had something in the pipeline just accelerated it extremely because they had to be in the market. If you don't have a digital solution, you're not in the game at all. So this, at, at one point, um, the audiences found themselves having to deal with, with such a thing. And they gained a lot of trust in, in the brands that helped them, helped them through this journey or this period, bad period of time. 
um, and they stuck to them basically. So I think the, the pandemic showed us um, the, the merits of these brands and the essence of these brands who uh, were quite progressive uh, and the, ahead of, of their time. Um, we at the bank accelerated a lot of our digital services quite quickly. Um, the other thing that really mattered during the pandemic is empathy. Um, the, the narrative of each brand had to be quite empathetic. You cannot celebrate a lot. You cannot, you need to understand that there is a certain down mood. Um, you want to get them out of it, but you need to be respectful of what's happening. A lot of people lost loved ones. A lot of people are facing um, uh, probably uh, unemployment and a lot of these things. So it, being empathetic and understanding where people are coming, are, are what people are facing uh, was quite important into brands. Um, brands in the banking sector had a different challenge. Uh, we couldn't come and say, everything is okay. It's gonna be fine. It's not gonna be fine. Uh, things are not okay. But we had to step up and say, or, or relay a message of resilience. Uh, that the banking sector in Saudi Arabia is very strong, uh, it's supported by the government. Um, we, we, we got your back uh, type of a message and uh, that things will get better slowly, uh, hand in hand in the future. Um, and, and to me, I believe this message is very, very positive. Um, and it was driven by the regulator and the government. So I commend, I commend whoever uh, felt the need uh, to put all this together moving forward. And we, we, um, we raised the bar quite high. Uh, the Saudi government made it look seamless, but it was really painful. Uh, but uh, but we, we did something right, because today we're much better off uh, than, than uh, two years ago almost. And I imagine that those, that messaging and that um, making sure customers know that you're there for them, that that still remains important as we, we move out of the pandemic. Um, what are the other key challenges that you, you think the industry is facing as we go, hopefully, into pandemic recovery? Um, there, there are multiple challenges looking at uh, the, the sector itself and um, uh, relating to the economy and what, what can be easy uh, to, to, to overcome and what are the things that, that stuck. Uh, a lot of businesses went, uh, went out um, and we would see a, 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 the entire industry of MS, MSMEs um, uh, shake up and get into a different realm. The players are different. Uh, the, the input is different. Uh, people's decisions into money is different. People want to save. Uh, they, want, they don't want to spend highly. Um, they, they also are bored for two years being stuck, almost two years. Um, so th there's that mix up between what, what is the right thing to market? What is the right thing to introduce into the, into the market? Um, and it comes down to solutions. Uh, the realm of solutions is way more important than just putting products uh, on the table. So uh, financing solutions, installment solutions, um, uh, pay, uh, buy now, pay later solutions, all of these to manage your finances. And at the same time in parallel, a lot of education and awareness needs to be uh, put into the equation as well. So we, we have our work cut out for us into uh, becoming some like a financial coach to, to some uh, clients. Um, and to the to the industry at, at whole, yeah, as a whole. We're seeing the same things in our data around customers just wanting to save more, just even where they're starting to feel more confident about the future, their, um, their behavior has just changed. And you know, there's still um, no international travel, which means customers have savings balances that are still high. But that idea of I need to save just in case and I need to think about what might happen in the future, which I don't think we've really seen in quite a while, probably not since the GFSA um, really persistent for customers at the moment. It's true, it's true, I agree. Um, and the, the, the problem here is that when people did stay at home, they didn't not spend, they actually spent more because their, their usual day to day uh, would, would be going to the supermarket and uh, coming back and doing all the errands themselves. Um, having to uh, get the services online, there's a fee. So instead of your time, you're actually paying for someone else's time or some, some other company's time. So the, 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 entire, the entire process or whatever we're going to see in the near future 
uh, is going to be surprising. So for research centers, there's a lot to, to find out. I remember one conversation during the pandemic was about uh, fitness and gyms. Uh, so a lot of people actually started gyms at their home. Uh, so I'm sure, so I haven't seen the reports to be honest, but I am interested to, to know and see that uh, the companies who sold uh, gym equipments must have skyrocketed. Um, and what is the effect after people go back? Um, they're, they're back now, but you find yourself still want, you have a, a gym equipment at home, you still have a gym subscription, what do you do? Where does the money really go um, after a while? And this is, this is quite interesting to see um, as, as a single industry. Just so much change, I think, that, that's happening and, and a lot that we still don't know about what the world will look like um, post-pandemic. But, but there's a lot to anticipate or forecast um, when it's bundled, bundled into um, uh, one lens. Whatever lens we look at, uh, it needs to be a lens that's quite holistic. Um, if we look at partnership and uh, financing, uh, um, like a, not financing, it's a banking relationship, then you come to a, a very interesting conclusion into what can be done. It's way more than just um, a commodity of money. It's way more than that. I want to change um, topics just a little bit and talk a bit about um, your current role as a um, as a leader within the the banking financial services community and, and at BSF in particular. Um, could you talk a little bit about the the goals that BSF has around women in leadership? Yes, actually, they're quite interesting goals. Um, in 2019, the goal was to have, um, a by, by 2023, to have 23% uh, of the, the workforce uh, to be women. Uh, now in 20, 2021, um, we are at 18 plus uh, percent. So I think we're going into the right direction. The reason we have this as a goal is because the banking sector generally does not uh, did not have a lot of women in leadership roles, um, but the bank one was one of the first to really have uh, women in their leadership uh, roles. And now, in our general management forum, uh, we have a chief uh, HR uh, or human capital. Uh, we're quite out uh, of that. We are yet to see women in uh, in boardrooms and. Um, in Saudi in general, and, and one of our one of the other banks also had a CEO, um, a lady at one point. Uh, so the, the sector generally uh, is moving towards having women inclusion um, in the financial sector. And um, th there's a lot of things to, to really commend uh, sector wise. From a BSF perspective, on the other hand, uh, many, uh, many initiatives were, were put together to um, to encourage women to, to, to be retained within the bank, not only in leadership, it's about the women workforce, um, certain programs and uh, uh, certain allocations and considerations into women, um, their children and uh, uh, nursery allowances, um, women to be, uh, to be more prone to have a career path within BSF, um, women to be more active in the society uh, from a CSR perspective. And uh, we also rang the bell in, uh, in the, um, with the United Nations and Tadawal, our, our index uh, for, uh, for, for women inclusion in the financial sector. Um, and, the, and along with that, um, we, uh, we are about to sign the uh, uh, United Nations uh, Global Compact uh, into uh, sustainability and women inclusion as well. And all of these activities is under the notion of us understanding and believing that um, uh, equality uh, is, is one of the topics that matters a lot to us, but it also leads to equal opportunities rather than just a women's uh, movement into, into the sector. Uh, this is a very important narrative because it's not about just women, it's about qualifying women, equipping them with the right uh, knowledge and um, exposure uh, to become leaders in the sector. Such great points. Um, what I might end with actually is, is a couple or a question for you around, um, you, you've had a really 
interesting and a really impressive career. Are there any lessons that you can share about what you've learned um, over the course of your, your career, in particular about leadership and um, just, I guess, any advice that you can give to people who are maybe starting out um, in marketing or in um, banking financial services? Sure. Thank you for, for that question, because um, I grew as a leader along the way. I, I wasn't born one. And um, it, it came down to the point where uh, a very strong realization that a leader is the person who, um, who has the job of facilitating uh, their team's job. So the, they're not my team to do my work. I'm actually, I'm their leader to, do the, to facilitate theirs. Um, and that was a very important lesson at one point in my life, quite early. Um, and this is where being, always being there for the team, that what's, what are the key to your success? What can I do to make your success possible? Not life easier, but success possible. Um, and this is one of the things that I find quite challenging because this means that if you have a team of 40, you need to be available for the 40. <laughs> And, um, and they, they, this creates a very interesting relationship. You find them, um, you find your team looking for solutions before coming to you and knowing that if, if I go to, to Sarah, then I've, I've exhausted all my, um, all my methods to come to her. And uh, this is where we need to step up, uh, whatever it is that needs to be done. Um, another thing is um, I'm, I'm a big fan of empathy and um, I talk about it a lot because it's, uh, it's not as easy said than done, you know, so it's not easy to just talk about empathy and then there are situations where you really need to, uh, to think about what is it that, that needs to be done in this situation where I would put myself in this person's uh, situation and um, if I had support, I would have probably been better off. Um, so th that is a very ro rocky kind of rocky road. Um, and there, there are a lot of things that, um, that I find myself sometimes overcoming or crossing a bit of a, of a line to really make that person feel comfortable at one point. On the other hand, uh, there are many ways or many situations where you find yourself um, uh, needing to push. Uh, there's a very thin line between um, pushing somebody to, uh, to, to be their best or pushing somebody to just deliver. Um, so th there's, always, there's always that narrative where just make it happen or let's do the best we can uh, to make it happen uh, type of thing. So it's not perfect, it's not always perfect. There are moments where this, you just lose it basically, um, but there are many moments where you, you consider the path and you consider the journey. And uh, we've been having a, a blast uh, uh, in BSF specifically because it's the best culture I've ever uh, been in in my life. Some really great points in, in all of that. Um, a lot that I think I learned from that as well. Um, a lot to think about. Um, it's such a great way of thinking about leadership. I really like that idea of um, having the way that you work with your team. That's such a great way of thinking about the work that we're, we're all trying to achieve and trying to go the same way together, um, which I think yeah. sometimes gets missed. Yeah, actually, I, I learned that from a lot of people along the way. And um, uh, throughout any career or any, any path, uh, you, you find yourself dealing with different um, leaders. And the ones that really stick are the ones that um, have your back in, in certain situations. I would always remember if, if I had a leader who's tough um, and just cares about results or whatever it is, I could learn a lot in, in the skills that I can develop. But um, I would always remember these moments with, um, with a lot of probably, um, I'm not going to say anger, but it's heaviness. Mm -hmm. because it was a period of time that I learned a lot, but I got so exhausted. Um, but at the same time, I do remember in a, in a, in a very subtle and very uh, positive memory um, context, those leaders who had my back and stood up with me. I, I always remember them very, very um, positively and still do. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Um, really enjoyed our chat a lot, um, a lot of really interesting uh, insights and, and ideas. Um, so thank you for, for coming on onto the podcast. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to it. I think it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see it. But. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Global Digital Banker podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and Podbean.